everyone, and welcome back to Modern Horror's look through the long-running found footage franchise, Paranormal Activity, with Paranormal Activity 2. When we last left our intrepid heroes, well, one of them was dead and the other one was possessed by a demon, but their little home movie had gone on to astounding profits. So with visions of dollar signs, Paramount hired Michael R. Perry to write a sequel and take advantage of some of that glorious, glorious name recognition. <laughs> Okay, that's not actually very fair. It's clear from the changes Paramount made, especially the new ending where Katie survives, that they wanted any sequels to be a connected story and mythology and not just a lame cop-out like a new family moves to the house. Which, of course, breaks all the rules anyway, since it was always Katie that was haunted and not the house. I think it was a great decision on their part, since if The Matrix or Highlander have taught us anything, it's the trying to retcon a series out of what was originally a standalone film with very little room for interpretation of the ending will leave fans bellowing BETRAYAL for decades to come. So they smartly left it open to continuation, and then immediately decided to set most of this movie before the first one, but then set the last 10 minutes after the first movie. So I guess if you can't decide if you want to make a prequel or a sequel, both is an option. Amusingly, Paramount actually had Saw 6's director Kevin Greuter signed on to direct this, but Lionsgate managed to summon some sort of legalese and forced him to drop this project and direct Saw 3D, which is actually kind of a bummer since this would have been a nice passing of the torch from one October juggernaut to the next. Either way, they brought in Todd Williams to direct with a $3 million budget, and this also marks the introduction of Christopher B. Landon, who would write for 2, 3, and 4, and then write and direct the marked ones. Rounding out the team, Oren Pelly and Jason Blum return as producers. After starting with a Paramount Would Like to Thank card, just like the first movie, we go into a haphazardly edited Welcome montage of Daniel and Christy Ray bringing home their first child Hi. named Hunter and introducing him to the rest of the family. Since this is the sequel, this movie needs to do more of everything that the first movie did, so the cast has kind of ballooned quite a bit. First we meet Martine, the housekeeper slash nanny and token magic Hispanic, then Abby, the German Shepherd, followed by Allie Ray, Daniel's daughter from a previous marriage, and, um, The front door open! Haunted door. Katie comes back as Christie's sister and immediately it feels like this movie has fallen into the found footage trap of why on earth are you filming that? I mean, this could have been the postman or a Girl Scout cookie and Allie comes to the door with the camera right in their face. How rude. Though, uh, the look at this framing, I mean, this kid knows what's up. Way to sex up the franchise, Paramount. Quick cut to about a year later, where everyone is hanging out by the pool, where we meet Brad, Allie's somewhat superfluous boyfriend, and get our first glimpse of the pool-cleaning robot in a small but pivotal role. He will rise again. Some uh, indeterminate amount of time later, I don't know, I kind of wish California had seasons, you can't really tell what's going on outside. But anyway, the family is documenting a break-in. The whole house is utterly wrecked, but only a necklace from Christie's mother is stolen. Now I'm going to somewhat spoil this, but maybe pulling the letter off the door means that Hunter is now really the hunty. Yes, it's cheap, but I like to pretend I'm clever. Because of the break-in, Daniel has several security cameras installed. Up from the original film, single camera, Paranormal Activity 2 has seven. We get the pool, we get Hunter's room, we get the front entrance inside, we get the kitchen, living room, front door, and the handheld camera, of course. Now that the setup is all done, the movie kind of settles into its stride, and thankfully the editing calms down quite a bit. I'm not saying this time. But the activity starts off pretty low-key, with the pool lights going out and the little cleaner robot getting pulled up out of the water. I don't know what strange sort of vendetta the demon has, but it makes a point to pop this thing out of the water every single night. But here's where I have a little bit of a problem. After the break in, the house was utterly ransacked, so if the demon did that, why would it suddenly tone down from completely wrecking everything to just sort of messing with the pool slightly? I mean, this is an activity that's so normal the family can just blame it on the dog. There's a coven of witches that gets introduced in the next movie that could have broken in and stole the necklace, but why would they wreck everything instead of just going for the things they were after? I get that the writers wanted to have the family get surveillance, but then didn't want to have the intensity pegged right off the bat. But what possible reason could a demon have for cooling it after so thoroughly freaking out the family? And yes, I do realize that I am complaining that an invisible demon is acting out of character. Anyway, let's get back to the action. Yep. Right. Action. That's a lot of grease in there. I have, I'm gonna drink it. Activity. Mm. Movie? Uh. <laughs> Movie? <laughs> Movie? Uh, 
Uh, do something creepy. <gasps> Creep out your characters a little, maybe, just a bit. Baby. Nothing much happens for the next couple of nights, but finally on night five, there's a loud thud while Martina's babysitting Hunter, so she freaks out and carries him with her while she burns a smudge stick around the house. In the middle of her attempt to bless the place, Dan and Christy come home, and when he sees it, he just freaks out and fires Martina on the spot. In the morning, he escorts her out of the house. All right, well, that was just so much intensity. Let's just calm things down for a little bit. Although at least this is finally an appropriate use for the family camcorder. Hunter, look over here. Hunter. Hey, hey, focus, kid. Focus. Eyes on mommy. Check this out. Dan has had this camera for at yeah, least a year, and he just now figured out it has night vision. Does everybody in this family have ADHD? A few nights later, the demon pops a pan off the rack in the kitchen and Christy puts it back up. But then it comes right back down. And clearly the demon is just going for a midnight snack. You're not you when you're hungry. Grab a Snickers. Stuff starts getting really serious on night 11 when a fire spontaneously breaks out in the stove. And that could seriously ruin someone's day if the house burned down. But did the demon just, like, get high and pass out while reheating some leftovers? The scene this filmed was actually pretty spooky, especially when the smoke starts going up the stairs. Action Dan hurls the flaming frying pan into the pool and then smoothly transitions into blaming Brad in a single deft motion. Ellie! I thought we said goodnight, Brad. Yeah, no, we did. Yeah, I'm not... Get the fuck out of here right now. Not cool, Brad. How could I put it up wrong? It's on a hook. Putting it on the edge of the top part instead of inside. Okay. Sorry, you want me to show you how to All put right. it up? No, 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 no. Then why are you putting the pool cleaner back in every morning? What's really interesting is that the more I watch this video of the pool cleaner going up the side, the less natural it actually seems to me. I don't know, the first time it seemed completely plausible, but now that I'm really thinking about it, how did it get over the edge? I mean, if it's suction, wouldn't it just kind of fall right back in? I think I'm, I'm now complaining that a pool cleaning robot is acting out of character. I have it set too high or something, I don't know. No. I think dispelling the skepticism so early in the first movie was a nice break from tradition. I mean, the skeptical dad is such a well-trod trope that making Dan so aggressively unwilling to entertain the notion of a paranormal explanation just feels like a studio horror movie checkbox that they had to do. Now, I'm not saying that he has to immediately dive right in and start believing in ghosts off the bat, but he's pretty mean to people that even suggest the paranormal. I mean, Martine goes from zero to fired real quick, and then there's this prank that he pulls on the girls in the next daytime <laughs> sequence. And the men just can't yeah. let go. It's not funny. <laughs> After the prank, Dan goes for a pre-date soak in the hot tub, which the demon has apparently set on a level. Oh, Did you leave the heater on in the hot tub? No. No? It's like a million degrees in there. No. Or maybe Ali really did leave the heat on. I mean, really, this could go either way. He says it's way hotter than it should be, but he doesn't really have any injuries, so he could just be exaggerating because it surprised him. Also, he never checked the hot tub when he went out to swim, so if this is something that needs to be turned on or off, and he's assuming that it was off, why didn't he go and turn it on before he jumped in? But if he turned it on off camera, how did he not check it to know whether or not it was really, really hot? All right, enough of my questions. It's the movie's turn. Dan and Christy go out on their date while Allie has Brad over and they set up a Ouija board. She has floated the idea that the activity in the house is being caused by the spirit of her apparently dead biological mother and wants to make contact. Spirit's present. You give us a sign. Okay. What do you want? Brad makes the board spell out something lewd in an attempt to give him a bit more personality. Let's <laughs> see. Maybe the spirit spirits want some pussy. <laughs> But then a force really goes for the board and spells Hunter. After Brad leaves, Ellie falls asleep watching TV, which starts displaying static. Which is actually pretty impressive for digital cable. I mean, is there a static channel somewhere that she switched it to? The shadow casts over right before she wakes up gasping. On the way upstairs, she sees the front door is ajar, so she closes it. But then there's a loud slam on it from the other side. She takes a step outside to check it out and the door slams shut, locking her out of the house. Now alone in the house with Hunter, the demon... 
lifts him out of his crib so he crawls down the stairs to the kitchen where he opens the basement door and then goes back upstairs into his crib where Dan finds him when he and Christy return from their date. What was the point of that even? Dan gets raging pissed at Allie when she suggests the door was slamming shut wasn't just the wind and everybody goes to bed with tensions high. Condensing the most important points from the next 20 minutes. Brad and Allie have decided that the family is being haunted by a demon, and they find out that people sometimes make deals with demons for wealth and power in exchange for their firstborn male heir, and Hunter happens to be the first male child born on Christie's side of the family since her, like, great-great-great-grandmother. When Christie shares the story of some of what's been happening here with Katie, Katie freaks out and angrily demands that she stop thinking or talking about it, because of how miserable dwelling on those sorts of events made their childhood. As far as scares go, we do get the cabinet doors flying open scene from the preview, but not much else. On night 19, the demon opens the basement door itself, which lures Abby away from Hunter. And... Dan and Allie take Abby to the emergency vet while Christy stays home with Hunter and the demon finally makes a move. Which is impressive since I like to think that I managed to magically bind it to a benign polyp on Donald Trump's lower intestine for all eternity for being a puppy kicking asshole. Christy gets hauled out of Hunter's room and halfway down the stairs, but actually manages to kick off the demon with pure motherly fury and tries to make it back to her son. Unfortunately, she gets grabbed again and hauled into the basement where she's locked for a few hours. At this point, she's probably completely possessed, but then does nothing. Dan returns to work while Allie and Hunter are at home where demonic Christy is sleeping it off. Allie tries to get Brad to come over, but this is probably the first time in history that Hey baby, my parents aren't home, want to come over, hasn't worked. Instead, she hears some noises from the basement and goes handy cam to check it out. And then she sort of randomly goes up to Hunter's room and finds Christy sitting there creepily. She turns and looks down the hallway because of a noise from her room and when she looks back, Christy is gone. She somehow managed to sneak around Allie, down the hallway we just saw, and pop up behind her to spook her when she goes in to take a look at Hunter. I'd like to know what happens during this cut, because despite going to tearfully call Dan, Allie actually picked up the camera on her way out of Hunter's room and brings it back up to show Christy absently staring out the window while Hunter cries. Showing Dan the security video of the possession finally convinces him and his first course of action is to call Martine because she clearly knew what was going on before any of them. She tried to warn me and I wouldn't listen. Apparently Martine knows the right magic ritual to exercise Christy and reattach the demon to a blood relative, which is to say, Katie. Dan and Allie have a short fight about it, but he has the last word and pretty quickly decides to curse Katie in order to save his wife and son. I'm doing it. I think this kind of takes Mika off the hook for causing some of the problems in the first movie because this is Dan literally cursing them. So as he begins our climactic finale, Demon Christy jumps Dan and then runs off somewhere with Hunter when the lights go out. They try to find Hunter in the dark and Ghost Adventures really makes this whole walking around by night vision thing look way easier. Dan finds Hunter in the basement, and Demon Christie starts beating the crap out of him until Dan cold cocks her with an anointed cross. The house shakes, then the lights come back on. They put Christie back to bed, and then finish up the ritual by burning the photo of Katie that Michael will find in the attic in the last movie. Three weeks later, Katie comes over and says that things are happening to her now, and Christie says that everything is better here, so the advice to ignore it until it goes away was the right idea. Katie drives off into the beginning of the first movie. It's just like Back to the Future, but opposite. Hello, baby. At the end of the first movie, demonic Katie wrecks the shit out of Mika's expensive camera. Take a look, she hits it so hard she knocks the timestamp off before apparently eating it. Afterwards, she lurches all the way back to her sister's house to finish off this movie. Though, serious question here, these movies don't end on the same night, so did nobody on the street notice Katie wandering in a vaguely southern direction, barefoot and covered in blood? According to the captions, the first movie ends on the night of October 8th, just after 3 a.m. The last scene of this movie says October 9th and cuts just before midnight. That's almost two whole days, even if we take the liberty of assuming that night of October 8th, 
really means 3 a.m. on October 9th. That's still almost 20 hours between Mika dying and Katie showing up at her sister's house. How far did she actually have to walk? The Rays live in Carlsbad, while Katie and Mika's house was in suburban San Diego. Even if we put them in very southern Carlsbad and very northern San Diego, that's still only like 10 miles. And even though Katie seems to be moving at a slow lumber, unless there's an immediate need for killing, even at literally one mile per hour, it still only takes 10 hours to walk there. So what was the demon doing for the other 10? I can't really picture her napping in the brush or sneaking through the shadows. So how did she avoid being seen? Did she just drive down there and then take a nap around the corner for the other 19 hours? I thought demons were more goal-oriented, man. But I digress. The movie ends with Katie showing up at the Rays and snapping Dan's neck from behind before going upstairs and force-pushing Christy into a wall. She takes Hunter and heads back into the night as the baby starts giggling and cooing. And that's that. Paranormal Activity 2 was... okay. I don't know, I'm just having a really hard time having strong feelings about this movie one way or another. I think if it wasn't part of the Paranormal Activity franchise, I don't know that I'd remember much about it at all. Because as a standalone film, it's maybe a slightly above average found footage horror movie. The main problem is that it drags a lot. Pretty much everything worth talking about happens in the first 10 or the last 20 minutes of the movie. So during the other 60, it's just a bunch of the same sorts of things repeating. Like they were just trying to fill the runtime. Doors open a bunch of times, the pot falls off the rack twice, Hunter reacts to something invisible at least twice. They almost always went handheld for their plot advancement, which meant that all their scares were on security cameras, but not every security camera scene had a scare in it. Plus they tended to go sudden and loud, so most of the time I was wondering if I was going to be startled or bored. Even though I was kind of annoyed at how often they went handheld, it's not nearly as bad as some other movies that I've seen, and they get points for thinking to use static cameras at all. Even though there wasn't a whole lot of tension, most of what the movie did have came from those. I just think that they kind of had too many of them. I don't know, what would you put? Is that like six? On its own, the story is pretty stock standard and feels mostly just like a rehash of the first movie, but with more background in the details. Paramount recut the first movie to allow the story to continue, but here they were actually able to plan ahead, so they were able to work in a lot of details that would relate to future entries in the series. They also pretty seamlessly integrated the first movie's story into this one, and on those counts, I think they succeeded admirably. Perfect handoff right there. Held against the first movie, this one kind of suffers a bit, because all the new cameras they had kind of sapped some of the tension that I loved from the original. The longer shots were a huge strength, especially at night, but in this one they kind of cut between cameras a lot, which breaks that up. Compare these two approaches to Katie coming up the stairs. Here there was one camera stuck in the corner of the room and we just heard slow thudding footsteps. But here we've got three different cameras, so we spend the scene cut between Katie walking towards the stairs here, Daniel? to walking up the stairs here, to Christy and Hunter's room reacting to the sound here. For found footage, the original Paranormal Activity was phenomenal, but this one feels very traditional, just with a veneer of found footage in front of it. Like a lot of other movies made since the start of the boom, that lack of really embracing the premise just makes them feel very bland. But as a sophomore entry in a series following an original movie that wasn't actually intended to be part of a series, yeah, you know what, it was okay. Well, anyway, thanks for checking out some modern horror and my look back at the Paranormal Activity franchise. Stay tuned, folks. Number three is way better. For more videos and updates, subscribe on YouTube, follow on Twitter, or like on Facebook. Cheers. I see a ghost.